Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Leah Salatero. Leah got her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Connecticut College, during which time she did an internship at Merck and also did undergraduate research in the labs of Professor Bill Hawkins and Professor Bruce Brancini. She then came to UC Irvine, where she recently completed her doctoral work in the group of Professor Scott Rignowski before coming to Cogent Biosciences as a medicinal chemist. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Leah. Thank you very much for coming on today. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm glad to share the story of our synthesis of strasserolides A and B. The strasserolides were reported in 2020 and were discovered through a high-throughput screening that was designed to discover novel antimalarial compounds. Due to the rise in drug-resistant plasmodium falciparum to malarial treatments such as chloroquine and artemisinin, the isolation chemists were searching for a new structurally diverse class of antimalarial compounds. The strasserolides were isolated from the fungus Strasula geniculata, which was originally isolated as an azenic culture from the inner root of an unnamed plant in New Zealand. They were evaluated against the drug-sensitive and chloroquine-resistant strains of P. falciparum. Strasserolide B was found to have an IC50 value of 13 nanomolar against the drug-sensitive strain, 3D7, and 32 nanomolar against the chloroquine-resistant strain, DD2, which is on par with the current leading antimalarials. Strasserolide A contains a ketone in place of the alcohol at C11 and has diminished activity, suggesting that the C11 alcohol is important for the mode of action. Strasserolide A and B are 18-membered macrolides containing two trisubstituted E alkenes and a challenging anti-1,3-dimethyl array at C6 and C8. We were intrigued by the bioactivity and the structural complexity, and so we decided to pursue the synthesis of strasserolides A and B. Retrosynthetically, we envisioned a convergent route targeting a carboxylic acid aldehyde western fragment and an alcohol vinyl iodide eastern fragment. The fragments were planned to be coupled through an esterification, and an NHK reaction would be employed as the key macrocyclization event. First focusing on the western carboxylic acid, we planned to perform a regio- and diastereoselective hydroiodination to set the E-alkene within the aldehyde fragment, and the macrolactone acid would be installed through a palladium cross-coupling reaction. The stereocenter within this alkyne was traced back to the terpene R-citronellic acid. As for the eastern fragment, the alcohol can be mapped back through an evans aldol addition to append the final carbons within the chain and set their relative configuration. The challenging anti-1,3 dimethyl array within the alkyne fragment would arise from Ferenga's enantioselective iterative conjugate addition chemistry. The precursor for the conjugate addition is easily accessible from s citronel -L. In the forward direction, we began the synthesis of the western fragment through a simple, high-yielding five-step sequence. From the methyl ester of citronellic acid, we ozonalized the alkene and protected the resulting alcohol. The ester was then converted to the corresponding aldehyde. To set the stage for the regio and diastereoselective hydroiodination, we needed to install an alkyne between the carbonyl carbon and the adjacent methylene. We implemented a two-step sequence that was previously reported in Ma synthesis of englarin A and Gen B synthesis of geodophenolide. Treating the aldehyde with bromine and triphenylphosphate, we were able to get to the desired geminal dibromide, but we also observed some of the vinyl bromide diastereomers. Fortunately, these inseparable side products were inconsequential as the next step is elimination of the bromides to the alkyne. When we treated this mixture with potassium terpetoxide and 18 crown 6, which were the conditions previously reported for the elimination, we saw significant formation of the undesired allene isomer. After screening some bases, we found that treating the bromides with LDA afforded only the terminal alkyne. We could easily cap the alkyne with the methyl group, which afforded us the desired alkyne in great yields. We attempted the elimination and methylation in one step, but we observed higher yields with the two-step sequence. With our desired alkyne in hand, we examined the regio and diastereoselective hydroiodination. Treating the internal alkyne with Schwartz reagent and quenching the vinyl zirconium with an iodide solution afforded the vinyl iodide as a single regio isomer and as the desired E alkene. This video shows how we quench the vinyl zirconium with iodide. Once the solution consistently stayed purple, we knew that there was full consumption of the vinyl zirconium to our desired vinyl iodide. 
The ester was then installed by forming the zinc homoenolate from this Roche ester derivative A and performing a Nagishi cross-coupling with the vinyl iodide. To complete the synthesis of this fragment, we perform a silo deprotection and oxidation of the resulting alcohol to the aldehyde. A saponification of the methyl ester with trimethyl tin hydroxide unveiled our desired carboxylic acid. The synthesis of the eastern fragment began from s citronellal First, we focused on setting the anti-1,3-dimethyl array within this fragment. We plan to use Feringa's enantioselective conjugate addition chemistry to set the second methyl stereocenter. A Wittig reaction of the terpene afforded the alpha-beta unsaturated thioester that was needed for the conjugate addition. Treating the thioester with copper bromide DMS complex, methyl Grignard, and this Josie phospholigand furnished the dimethyl array as a single diastereomer. Ozonolysis of the alkene and protection of the resulting alcohol afforded our desired thioester. To form the vinyl iodide that we were planning on for the NHK cyclization, we wanted to first forge an alkyne between the carbonyl of the thioester and the bound methylene. We could take the resulting alkyne and treat it under the same hydroiodination conditions that were developed for the western fragment. To do so, the thioester was reduced to the corresponding aldehyde using Fukuyama's conditions. The resulting aldehyde was then subjected to the three-step dibromination, elimination, and methylation sequence that was optimized for the western fragment. Similar outcomes were observed in this sequence. The dibromination always resulted in an inconsequential mixture of the vinyl bromide diastereomers, and the two-step elimination methylation sequence was higher yielding than the one-step procedure. The internal alkyne was exposed to the same hydrozircanation iodination method to yield one diastereomer of our desired vinyl iodide. We then turned our attention to installing the final feed carbons of the fragment. Removal of the cell protecting group and oxidation to the aldehyde cleanly afforded the precursor to the envisioned Evans aldol. Exposure of the aldehyde to the boron enolate of oxazolidinone C under standard Evans aldol conditions furnished the desired alcohol as a single diastereomer. With both fragments in hand, we began exploring the planned coupling and macrocyclization sequence. In theory, either esterification or the NHK reaction could be used to close the macrocyclic ring. But to circumvent chemoselectivity issues, we chose to first pursue the esterification as an intermolecular reaction. Many unsuccessful esterification methods were explored, including Sheena, EDC, DCC, PIBOP, HBTU, but we saw the best yields with the Yamaguchi esterification, although it was still quite modest. Closure of the macrolide was achieved through an intramolecular NHK cyclization to afford a 1.1 to 1 mixture of diastereomers at the C11 alcohol. The diastereomers were separated by chromatography and carried on separately. Hydrolysis of the auxiliary of both NHK products helped to assign the diastereomers. Hydrolysis of the R alcohol from the NHK cyclization afforded strasserolide B. The S alcohol could be oxidized and subsequently hydrolyzed to strasserolide A. Gratifyingly, the spectral data matched the reported isolation spectra. However, the first investigation of the NMR data was odd. We were missing some signals in the carbon peaks for strasserolide A. In a dilute deuteromethanol solution, the carbon peaks for C1 and C2 were missing, and the chemical shifts for C3 and C20 were slightly off. The C2 peak was observed in the HSQC spectrum in the appropriate region. This suggested that the peaks were shifted and broadened by an exchange process. All of the discrepancies were localized around the free carboxylic acid C1. If the effect rose from a dimer-monomer exchange of the carboxylic acid, it would be very sensitive to the acid concentration. We added deuteroacetic acid and found that it progressively returned the carbon spectrum expected for the natural product. Presumably, we were generating a mixed carboxylic acid dimer and increasing the exchange rate between the different forms. The spectra reported for the natural product also showed reduced intensity at C2, suggesting that line broadening was also observed in the isolation chemist spectra. The spectra of alkaloids are very sensitive to conditions and concentrations. It appears that carboxylic acids also show some sensitivity to concentration and that their spectra can be stabilized with added deuteroacetic acid. In this report, we've detailed the first total syntheses of strasserolides A and B. Strasserolide B was prepared in a convergent route with the longest linear sequence of 16 steps from R citronellic acid, while strasserolide B was prepared in the longest linear sequence of 17 steps. 
Moving forward, we're planning to confirm the bioactivity of Strasserulide B and prepare analogs to investigate its mode of action. Malaria is a worldwide epidemic, and Strasserulide B is a promising starting point for a new therapeutic agent. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Leah for joining us today. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast. Please feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date and see you all next time.